from uh, HDSA and welcome to the last uh, installment of the HDSA research webinar series for 2015. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dawn Lowe from UCLA, uh, I'd like to just uh, take a couple minutes to remind everyone uh, how to use the research webinars, uh, how to ask questions. Uh, you should see a, uh, a menu box on your uh, right-hand side of your screen. At any point during the, during the presentation, you can type in whatever question you'd like to ask Dr. Lowe, and at the end, we'll, uh, I'll ask those on your behalf. Uh, and we promise to try to get through as many questions as time allows. We recognize that this is maybe not the most ideal time for people on the West Coast, or you want to share this uh, webinar and information with one of your loved ones or caregivers. Uh, we are recording this and we'll archive it on our uh, website as well as on our YouTube channel, which I recognize that folks may not be able to uh, know what that means or how to find our YouTube channel. So here on our national website, hgsa.org, uh, you'll see in the gray, uh, these gray icons on the top right part of the screen, uh, on Facebook and Twitter, and here's a YouTube icon. And if you just click that icon, it'll take you right to our YouTube page where all of these uh, archived research webinars can be found. Uh, and we hope to get that up on our website within a week after this airing. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, we are scheduling webinars for 2016, so this series will continue again in 2016. Uh, in, on January 21st, uh, I will be pre presenting uh, an annual review of the year in research uh, for the past year. Uh, that'll be January 21st. And then on February 3rd, um, uh, Spiros Papapetropoulos from uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals will be presenting a, a nice overview of the Legato HD study, uh, which is studying a drug called Laquinamod in HD patients uh, currently. Um, as always, if there are topics that you'd like to hear more about, uh, you can type them or, or send them to, to us at research updates at HGSA, and we will uh, do our best to find a speaker that could uh, talk about that topic. All right, so uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dawn Lowe. Um, Dawn comes to us from uh, where she's a, currently an associate project scientist at UCLA in the laboratory of circadian and sleep medicine. Uh, she received her, her bachelor's degree in genetics at the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom and a PhD uh, from the Medical Research Center for Human Genetics, also in Edinburgh, United Kingdom. She is a postdoctoral fellow at UCLA um, in uh, studying neuroscience and, as I said, now has been promoted up to associate project scientist. Uh, in 2014, uh, Dawn was a recipient of the HDSA HD Human Biology Project Fellowship, and she will be presenting some of her work here today on, on a really exciting study that she, she and her colleagues at UCLA embarked on looking at uh, looking at monitoring at the title of her presentation, the at-home monitoring of sleep-wake cycles in Huntington's disease patients. And I'll just say that, you know, a couple of years ago in 2013, we had Dr. Jenny Morton on this research webinar series talking about some really intriguing data that were emerging from my, mouse models of Huntington's disease showing that there was appeared to be disrupted sleep and circadian rhythm uh, uh, patterns in mice expressing the mutant Huntington gene. And here we are a couple of years later where Dawn will be presenting what, sh what they're doing at UCLA to bridge that gap from what we're ob observing in mice uh, and other animal models of Huntington's disease and really strike at, strike at what's going on in the true model of Huntington's disease, and that is people, people affected by HD. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dawn. Let me try to change presenter here. Bear with me. Just a second. Hmm. 
I'm going to give new presenter rights Dawn. There you go. The floor is yours. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, George, for the invitation to speak, this opportunity to um, share some of the work that um, I've been doing and that we recently embarked on. Um, it was an excellent introduction. Um, thank you very much for um, funding the study. Um, it really helps us to make that leap between the lab, which is um, you know where all of us mouse biologists are, to the clinic, which is where the effect of our work should be um, seen. So this is a brief overview of what topics I'm going to discuss today. I'm going to start with explaining what controls our daily sleep-wake cycles. I'm going to show you some of the data about what the mouse models have told us about sleep-wake cycles in Huntington's disease, and address how we are trying to translate our model's findings to the clinic. And to start, really, the first question that we had was how common are sleep-wake sleep cycle disruptions in Huntington's disease patients? And um, to end, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about how the Huntington's disease community can get involved in this study and beyond. So circadian rhythms are daily rhythms. Uh, we have rhythms in sleep-wake cycle. We have rhythms in hormone production. And these are all controlled by what we call the circadian timing system. Circa means um, approximately, and dian means about a day. So this is from Latin. So a circadian rhythm is a rhythm that takes approximately one day to complete itself. Now, the master clock of the circadian timing system, we call it the master pacemaker, is in the brain. It's actually in our hypothalamus, right at the base of our brain. And it controls the, our daily rhythms of activity, of blood pressure, body temperature, um, hormones like melatonin, which some of you may have heard about, which is a nightly um, expressed hormone, um, is controlled by the circadian system. And core body temperature, which most of you should be aware, um, dips during the night, is also controlled by the circadian system. And um, the hormone cortisol that you think of as a stress hormone is actually a hormone that's controlled by the circadian system as, and is heavily involved in the waking process, which is probably why it feels so stressful to wake up sometimes. Now, these circadian rhythms are genetically encoded. So they are actually um, about 20-odd genes in our genetic code that codes for these molecular oscillators, and they're expressed throughout our body. So our master clock in the brain has these genes. Uh, different parts of the brains also express these genes. And we even have clocks in our heart, our liver, our kidneys, our adrenals, all over the place. And they control so much in uh, our bodies, and they control the patterning of our lives. Now, the rhythm that most of us are very familiar with is our sleep-wake cycle. Now, sleep itself is actually a very complex behavior. It has many components, but I think of it as uh, very basically being split into three major components, where we have the initiation of sleep, and then there's the maintenance of sleep, and then there's the end of sleep or wake onset. Now, the circadian system regulates the timing of the onset of sleep and the events that may precede wake. So I've borrowed this graphic from a textbook showing that the uh, circadian system drives alertness through the day. And as its effects decrease, the sleep system takes over and helps to maintain the feeling of sleepiness through the night. And as our sleep need decreases, the circadian system again kicks in with a little wake signal. Now, our sleep need is actually different between men and women, and it also changes with age we tend to need less sleep as we grow older. Now, critically for the circadian system, the timing of when we fall asleep and when we wake up also changes with age. Some of us are naturally early birds. Some of us are naturally night owls. Most of us are somewhere in between. And this is, again, genetically encoded. It's what we would call a chronotype, where chrono means time. Now, on the right, there is a graph here of um, chronotype over age on the x-axis. And to explain what the y-axis mean, means, it's the mid-sleep phase. So it's approximately when the middle of your sleep time is. So the smaller the number, the earlier you 
more likely to have gone to bed. And the larger the number, the later you go to bed. So if you're an early bird, you would have a smaller mid, uh, smaller mid sleep phase, and if you're a night owl, you have a bigger mid sleep phase. And you can see that this changes with age. Let's start here with young children. They tend to be more early birds. They go to bed earlier. And as they become adolescents, teenagers, they become more and more like night owls. Most of us may remember this from our own teenage years. Some of you may have teenagers who are refusing to go to bed till very late and uh, refusing to wake up till midday. That's natural. That's actually um, an age-related change in our chronotype. Now, the majority of people will then start to become earlier again through their um, mid-20s, um, 30s, and with every passing decade, our chronotypes tend to drift more and more towards the early bird chronotype. And I've plopped, and this graph um, from Till Ronenberg's lab shows also that women um, have generally earlier chronotypes than men for the majority of their lives until they become retirees. Now, why are we so interested in good circadian rhythms? Why should we be concerned when sleep and circadian rhythms are disrupted? We have plenty of evidence from human and animal studies that circadian and sleep disruption has terrible consequences for various um, things that we call as, uh, that we define as health. So cardiovascular health can be affected by circadian and sleep disruption. Metabolism can be affected. We can um, even head into a pre-diabetic state if we have very severely disrupted circadian and sleep uh, systems. Um, a particular interest of mine is cognition. Um, there was a study uh, over 20 years ago now um, showing that uh, stewardesses who uh, fly multiple time zones have um, more affected cognition than stewardesses who fly fewer time zones. And we duplicated that study in mice showing that even one jet lag event can actually severely affect your memory. And we also know um, that mood is affected by sleep and circadian disruption. Um, I'm sure most of us could attest to that. If you have a poor night's sleep, you're very likely to wake up grumpy. But this is particularly important in neurological conditions and neuropsychiatric conditions where there are a lot of side effects on mood. And we'd like to know if um, the sleep and circadian disruption is actually causative for the mood dysfunction. And I'd like to move on now to what um, animal models have told us about sleep-wake dysfunction in Huntington's disease. Um, several years ago now, um, we were funded to look at multiple mouse models of Huntington's disease, and we examined them to find that most of them had disrupted circadian and sleep rhythms. These disruptions ranged from delayed sleep onset, highly variable wake times, and reduced rhythm strength. And these disruptions are actually characteristic of a deficit in the circadian system which regulates the daily rhythms of behavior. So how we examine this is we take a mouse and we put it in a cage with a running wheel, and we record its running wheel rhythms over um, many, many days, usually about a month. And we also examine the sleep behavior of mice using video monitoring systems. Now before I show you some of the mouse data, I'm going to explain how one would read um, one of these activity graphs or actograms. So we plot them as um, slightly complex bar charts where every bar represents activity within a certain time, so example three minute bins or five minute bins. The height of the bar indicates how much activity was recorded during that time interval, so it can be higher or it can be lower. And the time of day is indicated from left to right, so this would be earlier in the day and later in the day. And a graph like this would then be plotted multiple times for each successive day. So this would be day one, day two, day three. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example um, from one of our previous studies where we looked at the back HD mutant on the bottom and as wild-type healthy control on the top. And what we can see here is that the wild-type healthy control has clear, very strong rhythms and with almost all of their activity during the night. These are nocturnal mice, and we've shaded the um, nighttime in gray, and you see that they are primarily active only at night. 
the back HD mouse, on the other hand, had weaker rhythms under um, normal lighting conditions, and it also showed more activity during the day when the mice should be sleeping. So this is really interesting as um, it seems to mirror some of the complaints that um, patients have um, uh, have had over time that they are unable to fall asleep, for example. Now another um, thing that we can do with mice is we can put them under constant conditions to examine what's going on with their endogenous circadian rhythms. So in this um, in these highlighted boxes, we have put the animals under constant darkness, so we've switched off all the lights in the room and they're left in complete darkness for about two weeks. And what happens in mice is that they will free run, because this is a genetically endogenously encoded clock, which defines how long the mouse will take to complete its daily activity cycle. And in the wild type example, you'll see that it's drifting a little bit to the left, suggesting that the mice are completing their daily cycle in um, less than 24 hours. And it's a very regular thing. You can measure it. The activity onset is precise from day to day. And this rhythm is about 23 and a half hours in its period. Now, the back HD animal down here um, is also rhythmic under constant conditions. But you'll see that it's not drifting as far to the left as the wild type animal is which means that the back HD animal is completing its cycle um, at roughly 23.8 or 23.9 hours every day. So it's much closer to 24 hours. Now, if you think of the wild type mouse as having a normal chronotype, then the back HD mouse has a different chronotype, and it could be more like a night owl than, say, a wild type con healthy control. We also examine sleep behavior in these mice. Um, here I'm showing you data from the Q175 uh, model of Huntington's disease. And in the graph on the left, we have plotted wild type animals in blue circles and Q175 mutants in green triangles. And you'll see here that the Q175 mutants have a severely decreased um, amount of sleep during the daytime. Now, what we've been doing in the last uh, two or three years is looking at whether we can fix this in uh, using very simple um, lifestyle changes in these mice. In the graph on the right, I'm showing you some very prelim um, preliminary data from a study that we were just completing, um, where we took Q175 animals, so all of these are mutant animals, and we housed them under three conditions. Um, in gray, we have control regular lighting cycle conditions. Uh, and in green, we um, put mice under regular lighting conditions. But what we also did was we scheduled their meal times to just their active phase, so at night. And that had a significant impact on the amount of activity that they showed at night. So they were more active during when they should have been active. And they were also sleeping more during the day, which is when they should be sleeping. And in a separate uh, group of animals, we housed them under very good lighting conditions where we boosted the amount of blue light that they get during the day. Now, the circadian system is particularly sensitive to blue-green light. So the addition of the blue light um, spectrum to these, uh, the lighting conditions of these animals also improved their sleep-wake cycle. In this graph on the left, I've quantitated the amount of sleep uh, during the day, the night, and the total amount of sleep in those, all three groups using the same color coding system again. And if I could just draw your attention to the daytime sleep, we're seeing significantly increased daytime sleep, which is when mice should be sleeping, in the group that was given scheduled meal times and in the group that was um, given a boost of blue light during the day. So this was very promising because it suggested that um, these, at least the mouse models of Huntington's, can be treated using very simple um, scheduled um, lighting and scheduled mealtime um, lifestyle changes. Now, what was really exciting and intriguing was that this scheduled feeding protocol and the scheduled lighting protocol also reduce some of the motor dysfunctions that we can measure in these mice. So the Q175 model, much like the back HD, R62, and other models of Huntington's disease, has some motor symptoms that can be um, detected 
when you put the animals on what we call the rotor rod test. Now the rotor rod test is essentially a, a rod that rotates, hence the rotor in the rotor rod. And the mice have to try to stay on this rotating rod that's getting faster and faster and faster with every passing minute. And typically, wild-type mice can stay on for a good 10 minutes, which is the duration of the test, and not ever fall off. Most models of Huntington's disease, however, um, start to fall off at about three, four minutes um, into the test, and that's depicted here in this control group, again, same color coding as before. Now, the mice that were given the scheduled meal times and the blue light treatment could stay on the rod for much longer than the uh, untreated animals. Not quite at wild type levels, but ameliorating some of the motor dysfunction that is caused by the mutant Huntington in, in this particular mouse model. So we were very excited by that, and we're looking to um, now examine the mechanisms by which this could be happening. Some of the mechanisms that we can study in mouse models, um, which unfortunately we can't um, in humans, is that uh, we can look directly in the brain of um, these mice. Now, the Huntington gene itself is actually expressed in the master pacemaker, um, the part of the brain that uh, controls our circadian system. And uh, what we can do is we can take that out of the mouse, dissect it out, um, and record the electrical firing from these um, neurons. So here's an image of what the SEM would look like under our microscope, and here's an image of the electrode that our physiologists clamp on to the neurons to record their firing. A special property of these SCN neurons, these um, circadian timing neurons, is that they're spontaneously active, and they're more active during the day than the night. And here on the left is an example of firing rates from a wild type, a healthy control animal, and on the right, the um, back HD animal is shown. And you'll see that the wild type animal fires more frequently in the same time than the back HD animal does. So the back HD animal neuron is not firing as much as it should during the day. And we think that this could possibly explain why the animals seem to have um, this disrupted sleep-wake cycle, disruptive circadian system. Now, on a positive note, we have been finding that this is a rescuable phenotype. This is something that can be changed. Um, a graduate student in our lab um, injected current into the neurons and found that she could acutely increase the amount of firing in a back HD neuron. And we also have some prelimin preliminary data from the same student to show that the scheduled feeding protocol that was so effective at um, fixing the sleep-wake cycle dysfunction as well as improving rotor rod performance also improves the firing rate of the SCN neuron. So it's all very promising work. It suggests that at this stage in this model, we can treat the sleep-wake dysfunction and it can have knock-on effects through perhaps the circadian system and beyond. But we're not quite satisfied with that because that's, that's all theoretical stuff. It's, it's stuff that's in the lab. It's true for maybe one, two, multiple, uh, maybe, maybe all the mouse models. But what we really want to do is to is to start translating our findings from the lab to the clinic. And to do so, um, we have uh, begun a study examining um, human HD rhythms. And I'd like to start by um, giving you a little bit of background on what's already known about sleep wave dysfunction in HD patients. Now, the sleep complaints are fairly prevalent. Uh, they have been documented at up to 90% of the patients. We also know that melatonin levels are reduced in HD patients. And most importantly, there's some feedback. Uh, we think most importantly is that these sleep disturbances are preceding the motor symptoms and that they occur in prodromal or presymptomatic individuals. And given what we know um, about the treatability of uh, the sleep disturbances in the mouse models, we think that this is an area where we could be contributing um, to finding treatments that can improve sleep-wake dysfunction in presymptomatic HD individuals. Now I'm showing here on the right some data from um, Jenny Morton's study um, in collaboration with Roger Barker. They're at um, Cambridge in England, and they they started um, looking at sleep-wake cycle dysfunction in HD patients um, about 10 years ago now. Uh, they here is an example of an act, uh, activity graph from a control, healthy, healthy control 
who is fairly active during the day and is um, has minimal activity through the night when they're asleep. Um, in this case, they have a symptomatic HD patient who is showing altered um, sleep-wake cycles. They are waking up a little later. It looks like here there's a nap. And there is considerably more, significantly more um, activity during sleep time. Again, suggestive of this dysregulation of the sleep-wake cycle in HD patients. So what we are setting out to do is, um, in some ways, a, a very similar study to what um, Roger Barker and Jenny Morton have done. We, we would like to examine sleep-wake cycles in HD patients. Critically, we would like to do this in the at-home environment. We would like this to be the, the baseline from which we can design good studies that, that target better interventions for sleep-wake dysfunction in HD patients. So, we applied to the HDSA's Human Biology Project and were very fortunately um, funded by it in, in, this, um, in this year. And the aims of our study are to determine the daily sleep-wake cycle of pre-symptomatic HD participants, caregivers, and healthy control subjects. And one of the things we want to do in this study is to use wearables. These are commercially available activity trackers like Fitbits and Jawbones as a tool for participants to observe their own daily sleep-wake cycle. So some of the tools that we're using in this study are sleep surveys, which have historically been used to help determine um, sleep quality and patient perception of sleep quality. We're also going we're also using chronotype surveys that help to determine if you're an early bird or a night owl or somewhere in between. We're providing participants with activity um, watches that research great active watch to record um, activity rhythms um, at home uh, over the course of several weeks. And in addition to that, commercial wearables that are able to automatically graph your sleep-wake cycles on your smartphones or, or your computers. So the ActiWatch um, is a research-grade tool. It's very sensitive. It tracks movements throughout the day and the night, and it allows us to monitor sleep-wake cycles. When we get the watch back, we can download it. And here is some real data from a recent participant in our study. You can see that um, the, the black bars, just like in the other actograms, is indicative of activity. So this is a day-active person. But the blue area indicates this when should be when sleep time should be. And you'll see that this participant has a, a fair amount of activity during the night. And what we can do is easily quantitate the daily sleep onsets, the daily wake onset, and how, a, how much fragmentation um, a participant may have during the night. And also, uh, in this particular research grade tool, there is a little window here. Um, oops that uh, behind which there's a light sensor and it gives us a lot of important information about the lighting environment which we know to be absolutely critical for timing the circadian system. Now the activity trackers that we're also providing to participants um, are made by companies um, like Fitbit, Jawbone. They're relatively inexpensive compared to the research grade tool and all of them come with this graphing software that you can download to your smartphone or down, download to your PC or uh, Mac to review your daily activity. And most of them can now track sleep. Uh, they also have very sensitive motion sensors inside them. And using a wearable like this, you can keep your own good records of sleep onset, um, how awake you are during the night, how restless you are during the, the night, and your daily wake time. So you can get um, something um, close to what we get from the research grade um, ActiWatch. And here I'm showing you two um, images that I've taken from my own sleep-wake cycle um, back in July. Uh, on this particular day, I had fairly good sleep um, and was had minimal restlessness during the night, fairly efficient sleep. Uh, so these are the types of reports that you can get, for example, from the Fitbit Flex or the Jawbone app. And on this um, other day, later in July, I had terrible sleep where I was awake for um, much of the night and had very bad sleep efficiency. Now, with information like this, uh, we, we hope that participants would be able to track their own sleep-wake cycle over time and see that, say, if they typically go to bed at 9 or 10 o'clock, they have good sleep. 
Um, but if they go to bed later, they have bad sleep, or you know, if they go to bed too early, they have bad sleep. And it allows um, us to self-correct our own sleep and find when the optimal time is for us to go to sleep um, to get a good night's rest. And the study itself is um, fairly straightforward. We ask participants to fill out the sleep and chronotypes surveys at the start. And then we send out the active watch to, um, to, for the participants to leave on their wrists uh, for three uh, solid weeks. So these are very robust devices. You can take a shower with them. You can take a bath with them. We only ask you to take them off if you're planning to go surfing or deep sea diving or something like that. And we also then ask um, participants to try out the Fitbit or Jawbone wearables for the second and third week of the study. Now these require a little more effort. Um, you have to charge them and you have to synchronize them to your smartphone or your PC. But it does allow you to then have instant feedback on your sleep-wake cycle. And at the end of the study, we're asking participants to return the Acti Watch so that we can download that research data. Um, so that we can get this baseline characterization of the sleep-wake cycle disturbances that may be affecting um, presymptomatic HD participants. And they are, allow, uh, they are asked to keep the Fitbit or Jawbone wearables for their own personal use. Now where would we like to go with this is um, you know, to design interventions or uh, advice that we can send out to HD clinics or neurologists we are aware that many um, neurologists are already prescribing sleeping aids and stimulants to um, patients. Uh, sleeping aids to help, you know, if you have insomnia, for example, and stimulants may help if um, you're having difficulty staying awake through the day. But the downside to these um, drugs that are currently being prescribed is that most of them treat the symptoms and are really not recommended for long-term use. Now what we would like to add to the toolkit of the neurologists and, and the clinicians is um, lifestyle tools. Um, so similar to what we're seeing in the animal models, we believe that um, scheduling your meal times and using light therapy can really um, make an impact on your sleep weight uh, cycle. Uh, we know from other studies in humans, um, healthy controls that scheduled meal times can alter rhythms in metabolism for the worse if you're eating at the wrong time, and for the better if you're eating at the appropriate active phase time. And light therapy has been shown to be effective for patients with mood disorders. Uh, seasonal affective disorder is probably the best known example of this, where bright light therapy um, is very effective at reducing the behavioral symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. We would like to add this component of the blue-green light so you don't have to use as bright a light um, because the, sensit the sensitivity of the circadian system is that much greater to blue-green light. And we also know from other studies in neuropsychiatric patients that making small changes to your lighting environment and improving your sleep hygiene can really also help improve um, behavioral symptoms. So if you are um, a patient, uh, H, uh, if you're positive for HD, or if you're a caregiver of someone or a family member of someone with HD and you'd like to participate in the study, please feel free to contact me at uh, hloh at ucla.edu if you fit into our categories of being a pre or early symptomatic HD patient, a caregiver, or a healthy non-caregiver. And if you're unable to participate, feel free to email us anyway to be notified of our future studies. And we would appreciate feedback um, from the HD community, which we would find very useful for designing future studies. So I'd like to end with um, acknowledging my collaborators in this. Uh, we are collaborating with the HDSA Center of Excellence at UCLA, which is directed by Susan Perlman. Dr. Perlman's team include Eric Johnson, David Hendrickson, and Alex Quackle, who have been super at finding us participants for the study and have been so supportive. This study is also supported by the HDSA Human Biology Project and I want to thank George and the other members of his team for giving us this chance um, to translate what we're finding from the lab to the clinic. And in the lab, um, our work is funded by the CHDI. Our PI is Chris Colwell, and the following members of our lab were instrumental in collecting the data that I have shown you today. So I will go back to this particular slide, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you so much, Dawn. That was fantastic. Um, I'll just remind people, uh, if you have a question for Dawn, feel free, uh, please type it in the question box and, and click send now. Um, I'll also, Dawn has up here, you know, her, her email address and, and what folks are, what they're looking for in terms of uh, participants. Um, I'll also remind people, I, I meant, forgot to mention this. Um, I can just show you a slide. Uh, bear with me, is that Dawn's study is also on our um, HD Trial Finder resource, which hopefully you can see here, a screenshot. Um, so all the information in terms of inclusionary and exclusionary criteria and how to get involved are also listed in, in this resource. And highlighted in blue is up until just Two weeks ago, uh, it was all a web-based resource, but now we we do have a call center, uh, which is staffed from nine to five, Monday through Friday, we ha um, by professionally trained uh, people that can answer your clinical trial questions. And if you're running into in the issues using the website or want to get more information about a particular trial, this is a good place where you can actually talk to a human being and get some assistance about it. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that and, and mention that Dawn's trial and study is actually listed in the trial finder. Um, so what, one question for you, Dawn, is uh, can people outside of Southern, the Southern California area participate? Indeed. We now have approval to send these um, packages out. Um, yes, you can participate uh, anywhere that I can send a FedEx package to. Oh, fantastic. And how many people are you particularly looking for in this study? Both are you looking for a certain number of pre-symptomatic and caregivers and controls? We're we're really hoping to get um, good sample sizes here of uh, 20 or perhaps even more um, participants because with um, with all these things, uh, the, the 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 more people we have, the more data we have, uh, the more sure we can be of our findings. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's see, I have a question here. Uh, did you, this is a question that, for, from me, um, did you see, going back to the mice, I know we're most interested in the human study, but uh, did you see in your effect in the different HD animal models a difference between, was there a gender effect? Did you see that the mice, the male mice had a more abnormal uh, sleep pattern, circadian pattern than the female mice? I'm, I'm so glad you asked me that, George. Um, uh, we have just completed a sex difference study in the back HD model. That's the only model we've looked at so far. But yes, we are seeing uh, a sex difference. Um, so the male mice seem to show the, their symptoms earlier than the female mice, um, both in terms of their circadian rhythm disruption as well as in their motor dysfunction. Right. And that study was informed again by um, you know what what we're finding what we're seeing in in um, patients this variability um, between the sexes. But again, with the the power of the mouse model is that the mice are all very similar to each other, so you know we can actually de define um, sex differences in in mice because they're also highly related to each other. Mm -hmm. So what would uh, what's what's next? Pending the success of this recruitment of the study and identify differences, presuming you see differences in, in pre-symptomatic um, and symptomatic HD patients, um, which kind of correlates with what we're seeing, the field is seeing in mice as well as your lab, what, what would be your first next step that you'd like to do? Is it a blue light or interventional type study or so some of this will be very dependent on our findings. So the reason why we are using this research grade actigraphy tool is because it gives you such um, fine resolution of the onset of activity and onset of sleep and how fragmented activity or sleep are. And each of these different changes allows us to guess which system is involved. So if we're seeing that um, there is a disconnect between um, light and activity, for example, we, we may favor um, a scheduled meal uh, treatment as opposed to light treatment. 
Um, but if we're seeing that really what's happening in patients is that they they have excessive nighttime light, for example, then we will be um, seeking to intervene by uh, providing advice uh, to the clinics as well as uh, actually testing the hypothesis that this excess light at night may be causing some of the sleep insomnia. Great. Um, one question here was just uh, from, the, from the audience was repeating the contact information. And if I remember correctly, it's H -lo, so H -l -o -h at ucla.edu. Is that correct? That's correct. So that's it's H L O H at UCLA .edu, edu um would contact directly the Dawn if you're interested in getting some more information. Um, there was another question about when the webinar will be online and that hopefully within uh, we typically aim for within a week, but it might be just hopefully by the end of this week we can get that back up online. Um, there's a question about do you need your own Fitbit or jawbone? And the answer is sorry, I'm stepping in for Dawn, but no, so you'll be provided with a, a Fitbit or related device that you actually get to keep for your personal use. Um, here's another question. What type of blue-green lights could be used in the home setting and what would the impacts uh, and would the impacts be greater using both better lighting and the scheduled meals together? We think that um, yes, there's probably a cumulative effect um, of using both scheduled meals and blue light, uh, blue-green light. And as for the types of blue-green light, what we've been using in the lab on the mice is LED lighting. Um, and I know that uh, such systems are also being developed for the home environment. Um, there, there are at least two manufacturers that are producing LED lights that you can change the color spectrum. Um, within the same bulb. Form. So those may be particularly useful and, and we'll be looking into um, how we can use those um, to, to intervene with um, improving sleep-wake cycles. Okay. Here's a um, question, more of an eligibility question you may or may not be able to answer, Dawn. Um, a, a participant has a, a daughter with HD. Uh, with that sleeps excessively, sometimes uh, two days uh, with short wake, uh, short waking breaks, uh, uh, or can be up for his, for more than 24 hours at a time. Um, was diagnosed over five years ago with HD. Um, is this person would this person be eligible for this study? Are they? Um, we we are currently. Um, Defining eligibility um, by, um, I guess, the UHDRS score. So if, if you know your score uh, and it's under the, um, I can't remember the exact number right now, um, but it's on the trial finder um, information. Um, it, if you're still under that score, you're eligible for this study. Um, one of the reasons that we're not um, seeking uh, full-blown um, symptomatic HD patients right now is because uh, we, we have good evidence from the um, Cambridge group that uh, of uh, sleep weight dysfunction in full-blown HD. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question, when will the study begin? The study has begun, right? That's right. Yep. We're, we're deep in it. <laughs> Yeah, so deep in it and, and looking for more participants. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to reach out to Dawn. Um, here's a question, have, which I'm not familiar with. Have you tried the basis peak sleep and activity tracker? No, we have not tried the basis peak um, sleep and activity tracker, but I'll certainly look into it. Um, it's another question, and it's a, it's a very common question um, that we receive from uh, the community in, in terms of participation. If we're participating in another clinical study or clinical trial, can we still participate in this study? Um, we would ask that if you are participating in another clinical trial, um, if, it's, if it's something that's going to affect your sleep-wake cycle, um, that you either alert us or um, you know make your own judgment call of whether you think it's affecting your your what is your base um, sleep wake cycle. 
is um, some trials uh, may uh, some some drugs on trial may may have stimulating uh, or arousing effects or um, sedative like effects, and that may confound um, our study as it stands right now. Yeah. But if you are in, uh, I know many in the community are paid participants in the observational study in Roll HD. That would not should not be an issue in participating in this sleep study, right? Oh, no, not at all. In fact, that, that would be super, because if you are in the Enroll study, you will also know your UHDRS yeah. number. <laughs> um, one individual has uh, used a Fitbit for a year and was wondering if you're interested in uh, their historical data, sleep data, or is it just the three weeks of data that you're most interested in? Um, the way our study is designed right now, um, we would not be able to include um, a whole year of data. Uh, we're, we're sort of trying to keep the study in a very short format so that it's not too onerous on our participants. But you're very welcome to get in touch and, and um, I could send you out um, the ActiWatch, for example, and you could participate in the trial and we could then use the Fitbit information at, from that same um, time frame. Great. Um, will you uh, share information with the participants during the study about their individual sleep-wake cycle? Um, so uh, that's, that would um, not be within the scope of this particular study. Uh, what we're hoping is that the Fitbits or Jawbones, you know, these trackers and the, their software would allow you to make your own observations at this time. Um, we, we are um, not set up to diagnose any sleep-wake cycle um, nope. dysfunction in this study. Okay. Um, another question about light, and I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but is a 10,000 lux all-spectrum light good? I'm not sure exactly what that means, but maybe you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go with in well, your research. Here's a, here's a very informed person. Um, 10,000 lux of light is good at certain times of day, I would caution against using that beyond sunset or even in the late afternoon. Um, so the, these um, bright, bright lights are typically used uh, to um, treat SAD, um, typically in people from the sort of more extreme latitudes uh, who don't get enough daylight. So at, at, at the moment, my advice would be, yeah, sure, use it during the early day. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, there's one or two more questions. Um, will Will you be able to make recommendations to participants about personalized blue light and scheduled feedings? Um, we would love to do that in a follow-up study. I think right now what we really need is um, that good baseline of what's going on. Um, it, I would caution against, um, you know, making drastic changes to um, your lifestyle. You, you know, all these, uh, all the information about scheduled meal times and sleep hygiene is freely available, and and your, I, I would encourage you to look into it and to make moderate changes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, let's see. One more. Um, the participants would have to have their own smartphones, is that correct? They're, and yeah, they, they're, they're, UCLA is not, I'm answering that for you, Dawn, they're, they're not giving out smartphones. The <laughs> assumption is uh, most everyone has a uh, either an Android or a, an a Apple phone that they could download the Fitbit software to. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, we're not giving away phones. They're not giving away phones. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, beyond the, it's beyond our budget. Yeah. Um, let's see, and, and um, where is the sleep-wake cycle information available? I'm not exactly sure what, what's meant by that question. If you're referring to um, attendee, if you're referring to the, the mouse data that Dawn presented, um, there, there is a we there's a webinar that we have archived uh, on the HGSA website or on the YouTube channel that has that information, but uh, if you have a particular
piece of information you're looking for. I'm not exactly sure regarding the sleep-wake cycle. Um, and then just finally, uh, once again, uh, one more final question is, can you provide your, your contact name and email address one more time? I can put up your um, slide if you still have it open, Dawn. Yes, it's open. And you, the presenter, so everyone can see it one last time. Uh, there's, her, there's Dawn's email address. Hopefully everyone can see it. And um, uh, if you're interested, certainly feel free to contact her. And, and, and Dawn, as you can already tell, is, is expert in this area and should be able to answer any question you may have. Um, so that's it. It looks like there's, uh, we've hopefully covered everyone's question. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating. I wish everyone a really happy holiday season and a, a happy and healthy new year. I want to thank you, Dawn, so much for taking the time out of your day, getting up so early on the West Coast to present this to the community. Um, I really think it's fantastic. It's, it's a, it is, as I was telling Dawn before the call, it just is a perfect example of why HDSA has uh, created the HD Human Biology Project, is to help scientists, bright scientists like Dawn, uh, make that transition from the observations they've seen in mouse models or other models of Huntington's to see if it's really true in humans. And we're seeing it uh, in full force here with, with Dawn's presentation. So I want to thank you again for, for your time and effort you put into this great presentation, Dawn. Uh, and thank you all. And uh, hopefully you'll join us in the new year with our new research webinar series um, in 2016. So thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.